Uh, welcome to the Bedford Lyceum, uh, which is um, hosted by the First Parish in Bedford, Massachusetts. And uh, today we're privileged to have um, Larry Hertz speak about circadian and other biological rhythms. Um, and just a little bio. Um, Larry is a retired psychiatrist, you, mostly at the BA, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> at the Bedford VA and at Boston University. He was a clinician, educator, clinic chief, service chief, and researcher, and has almost 40 years of interest in, but no papers on, chronobiology. Um, and uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind people that this presentation is being recorded. If you have any questions um, uh, or concerns about that, please feel free to email me. And I'm putting my email address in the chat. And why don't we start, Larry? All right, happy to. Um, I appreciate your setting this up, Ellen, and thank you, Webb, for uh, being our tech. And thank you all for your interest in attending. Uh, I have uh, such a pleasant task today because this is such a wonderful subject. All of us are thinking about time all the time and uh, don't think about its interaction with our bodies much. And we want to use our bodies and schedule our time uh, more or less for our own purposes without much consideration of how they interact. Uh, it's a little bit like the skater skating over a, a, a wonderful aquatic river and only being concerned about the, uh, the contour of the ice. And what's going on underneath is just so fascinating. Nature has given us this wonderful, important, and helpful mechanism that few people know much about, uh, and we make our plans without it, and we sometimes thwart it. I also am noticing that uh, I myself am exhibiting cycles while I'm speaking. I seem to be going through yellow and purple cycles on a several times a minute basis, and that can entertain us while we talk about other kinds of cycling. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about chronobiology, uh, what biological clocks are and their mechanisms. I'll talk a little bit about what happens when clocks go bad and uh, delve into therapies that are being devised using clocks and for clock problems. And then at the end, we'll do a little uh, blue sky speculating and that's a, a joke you'll get later, on what chrono hygiene might look like. <clears throat> so first, I'm going to tell you how I got involved in this. I am not a chronobiology researcher, uh, and I have been very casual about time myself. I went through college and medical school internship and res psychiatry residency without learning about biological clocks and it only changed by accident during my geriatric psychiatry fellowship. I did a fellowship at the Bedford VA GREC, Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center, and its uh, director at the time was a fellow named Ladislav Volitzer. Um, yes, the Ladislav Volitzer, familiar to many first parishioners. And uh, Ladislav was very, very interested in Alzheimer's dementia, and that was in fact the mission of the Bedford Grec. There were a hundred inpatient beds for people with severe dementia, and uh, Ladi had novel ideas about how to care for them that have since become uh, accepted and uh, commonplace. So he was an early hero in clinical care, uh, he was a great advocate for Alzheimer patients and their families and for the field of Alzheimerology, if I can call it that. Um, he also researched what was behind Alzheimer's and its problems and kept a wet lab, a biochemistry lab near his office at the VA. Um, 
So uh, hats off to Laddie during this talk. Uh, he got me started. I don't think he was a, a big chronobiology fan, but the following happened to us. Uh, we were very interested in the major clinical problem of Alzheimer's dementia, which is agitation. People can put up with caring for a spouse who has incontinence. They can put up with caring for a spouse who has insomnia, even day-night reversal for a while. But when agitation comes on the scene, as it does for well over half of patients with dementia, that often means institutionalization. And uh, almost all of the patients we were caring for uh, in the dementia study unit had been institutionalized because of violent behavior. So there were several approaches to dealing with that at the time. Uh, American medicine is particularly fond of finding the pill that will erase the symptom. And uh, so many of us were looking for what we thought of as a serenic drug. In other words, uh, patients don't have to be zonked, but they should be calm. And that uh, search over the last 40 years has largely been fruitless. Uh, another approach which Laddie uh, was pretty interested in, I think his European background may have helped him uh, think this way, was non-drug approaches, sensory stimulation and deprivation, uh, particular forms of interpersonal interaction. And these were somewhat more successful, but haven't really turned into good agitation therapies. Uh, the third and subtlest was the notion that along with Alzheimer's dementia, there might be a change in the brains or systems of patients who got it that led to more anxiety or paranoia and led them to behave in an agitated fashion. So something internal or endogenous as, as the MDs would say, um, an endogenous anxiogen makes you more anxious. Um, and there were some candidates from rat models. The rats uh, got very anxious with a lot of candidate molecules. And uh, one laddie was very interested in was a class of small molecules called the beta carbolines. Could beta carbolines be the internal anxiogen that uh, we needed to find out about? If, if they were, we would have been able to find what receptors they bound to and how to make a drug that was similar and would bind even tighter, but not turn on those receptors, it would have been a heroic cure. So uh, during one of our meetings, Ladislav said, uh, Larry, how would you like to be a guinea pig for beta carboline research in humans? All you would have to do is freeze a urine sample every two hours over the course of two weeks and twice during that time fast for 24 hours. Well, who can resist an opportunity like that? So I jumped right on it and headed home with my um, 100, what would 168 uh, plastic tubules. And two weeks later brought the frozen specimens in for Laddie's uh, lab tech to quantify. And the lab tech was looking for levels of beta carbolines. This resulted in two kinds of graphs. One was a simple time series that laid out every specimen and its contents in beta carbolines in nanograms per liter or whatever units we used. And the other was um, something more relevant to later in the talk, so I'll describe it a bit for you. Um, all the Midnight specimens were averaged, and that was plotted on a single day's midnight bar. I should do that over here for your sake. And then all the 2 a.m. Uh, averaged and plotted at 2, all the 4 a.m.s and plotted at 4. So we ended up with a uh, sort of specimen single day with the averages during of, of, of the amounts of beta carboline during each of the periods in that day. And it showed a nice circadian peak and trough pattern. So this was a compound that uh, had circadian distribution. But unfortunately, the time series showed that 
whenever I had fasted, beta carbolines had dropped out and only uh, showed up again at, after refeeding. So they were in fact a product, a metabolic byproduct of eating. They were not an endogenous anxiogen. Had they been, Laddie and I would both have had very different careers starting from that point. But as a consolation prize, Laddie suggested that I go present a poster of the results at the first Gordon Conference on Chronobiology. Gordon Conferences are called Summer Camp for Scientists, but in fact, they are uh, very elite affairs. So there were uh, sort of worker bees like me presenting some data and the luminaries of each field uh, talking about the most important discoveries they'd made and uh, strategizing about how to bring the field forward. And there I met wonderful, wonderful uh, international heroes of chronobiology, and I also found out what it was. So I'm now going to show you what it is. Uh, I, I hate it when lecturers read their slides to the audience because the audience is then trying to read and listen, and I won't do that. I'll just shut up when I show you a slide. Um, and uh, let you read it, and then I'll make some annoying comments during that process. So let me start trying to share the screen. And so uh, what is chronobiology? Okay, you've all zoomed through this and have read it, and I want to emphasize that bio what biological clocks are nearly universal means is that single-cell organisms like blue-green algae, uh, cyanobacteria, uh, they have clocks that uh, give advantage their biochemical processes uh, with daily rhythms. And anything that nature has invented separately several times is terribly important and uh, confers a reproductive advantage to any organism that has it. Organisms that don't have, have it are less likely to live to reproduce. And the way we see the evidence of that is that the genes are conserved. They don't drift by mutation through evolution. They're highly conserved. So this is something nature considers extremely important, the clock. When you get down to 1954, uh, this guy, Jürgen Aschoff, um, found World War II bunkers far from any city, and he outfitted them so that volunteers could spend two week stints in them, protected from signals such as traffic and light, and uh, could go about their business of waking, sleeping, and eating at their own speeds uh, in uh, sort of... Uh, near darkness, and he was able to time what they did. Uh, he determined that humans, like other organisms, have endogenous clocks, clock, biological clocks inside that are independent of the sun and other uh, time cues. Time cues he named Zeitgebers, time givers in German. He got the Nobel Prize for that. Colin Pittendre um, found that there could be more than one rhythm running at different intervals in the same organism, such as sleep-wake cycle and core body temperature. He also found that if you removed all time cues, animals sometimes didn't have 24-hour rhythms, but had somewhat different rhythms and might split off their rhythms to 48 hours or 50 hours after a certain amount of free running. And he got a Nobel Prize as well. <clears throat> so in 
So I met these two Nobel winners and I listened to Bill Frashevsky talk about uh, his chronologically informed chemotherapy and its survival benefits. Um, it, and these were, this was clearly a young thriving field at the time and uh, convinced me to follow it. So we're gonna talk now about what chronobiologists uh, are looking at and how they measure it. First, ultradian rhythms. Uh, the examples that come first to mind are brain rhythms, the rapid eye movement cycle <clears throat> of sleep, and the nasal cycle, which you may not even be aware of, but one nostril enlarges and the other constricts, uh, and they take turns on a maybe two to three hour basis throughout the day. The circadian rhythms are much more familiar. And infradian rhythms. Uh, this third example uh, is much less research than the others, but I've been doing my best and friends tell me they agree. And uh, I, I don't know whether some of you remember the, the choir doing uh, the piece, something told the wild geese it was time to fly. Summer sun was on their wings, winter in their cry. Well, what told the wild geese was an infradian rhythm. It was a change in the photo period, meaning the length of time sun is shining on them. And to them, it meant migration. So I put down hibernation, but I should have added migration too. All right, measuring rhythms. Um, here are some of the ways chronobiologists measure rhythms. Actographs are uh, little movement detectors you wear on your wrist like a watch. And now your cell phones, phones all have them so they can measure your steps. Uh, a phase response curve is like what I described uh, Dr. Volitzer doing, graphing over one cycle an average number of many measurements uh, to show a circadian uh, rhythm, but with the twist. Uh, what we're actually graphing is the magnitude of impact a stimulus has on uh, a circadian rhythm. The next slide is the hardest one I've got for you, if not the most annoying, but I'll explain it. Here is uh, Waterhouse's uh, 1980s slide for core body temperature during a 24 hour day. And like the graph I mentioned with the beta carbolines, this was actually uh, many, many time points, probably from many, many people, plotted as though they were uh, measured almost continuously in one person, but a very good representation of the human circadian rhythm in, in core body temperature, which reaches a nadir at 3 a.m. and uh, a peak at an acme at uh, about 3.30 p.m. So uh, here comes a phase response curve, duck. So this portrays um, the 24 hour day. Each one of these little vertical gray lines is uh, an hour. And we start with 6 a.m. Next bold one is noon, next bold one is 6 p.m., next bold one is midnight, and then 6 a.m. again. And we're looking at bright light, dim light, and melatonin in their effect on uh, bodily rhythms. So during the day, uh, about 8 a.m. to maybe 4 or 5 p.m., bright light and dim light do nothing. They're down at zero. They don't advance or delay circadian rhythms at all. Uh, as you get toward uh, 8, 9, 10, and 11 p.m., bright light makes your brain think 
hey, wait a minute, uh, maybe the day's longer than I thought. I better drag out the circadian rhythms. I better slow things down. And then there's this funny thing that happens at 2 a.m. <coughs> excuse me, when uh, suddenly the brain begins to think, no, uh, the next day has begun. I'm going to phase shift uh, in a positive direction and advance rhythms up to four hours. Now, uh, you, you don't simply look at a bright light and suddenly get a phase shift of four hours. This is probably uh, an exposure of over 30 minutes of bright light on several days before these phase shifts happen. But this phase response curve shows what light is capable of doing to the clock. All right, so uh, let's talk about the clock. What, how can all this happen? What, what is meant by a biological clock? Um, biological clocks use what we have to work with. They employ the central dogma of biology, which is that DNA in the nucleus makes RNA, which travels outside the nucleus to the cytoplasm and gets transcribed into proteins or translated into proteins. Proteins do the business of the cell. If you are a pancreatic island cell, you make insulin and some of the proteins make insulin and excrete it. There are others that do cell maintenance functions, uh, cell division functions, and uh, some of them actually do clock functions. So there are probably about five genes in the human that uh, form this biological clock. And they form it by feedback loops. And I'll explain that in a moment. <clears throat> So uh, resetting clocks in peripheral tissues, meaning outside the central nervous system, there is a biological clock in every single one of your cells except germ cells, meaning uh, cells that are going to form sperm and egg, and uh, stem cells, which can form any, uh, any tissue as needed, but haven't formed a particular tissue yet. And interestingly enough, cancer cells have suppressed their biological clock. So every other cell, by far the vast majority in the body, has a biological clock going that controls things like insulin secretion and readiness for hunger and readiness for exercise. Uh, about 4 p.m., the proteins that control how strongly your muscles can contract, kick in, and you can press the, the most weight about then. Uh, <clears throat> everything, in short, that your body does is done by a, a, a local clock, and the master clock controls it. Now, <clears throat> you're probably cleverly saying to yourself at the moment, how can that possibly be 24 hours exactly every day of my life so that I don't drift through the um, solar cycle over a period of months or years? And in fact, it is what I've described to you now. And I can, anybody who wants to ask more about the feedback loops uh, can ask in the question and answer period. Uh, they take 24 hours and 11 minutes. Now, uh, it was clear by the time I uh, sort of joined the in enthusiast group that something had to reset the clock, something had to reset the master clock, and it was clear that that was light. Here are some hints. In rats, you can see these two little hypothalamic nuclei, little paired things right on either side of the midline, right above the optic chiasm where the optic nerves cross and head back to the uh, optic cortex. And these two little um, nuclei of just about 20,000 cell bodies 
turn on just like paired light bulbs in the dark. And they turn off at, uh, during the light. Uh, that is the master clock of the, of the rodent uh, behaving in a way that resets the rest of the clocks in the rest of that body. Ours turn on during the day. So we knew that there are suprachiasmatic nuclei in humans, and uh, we knew that they were not resetting the clock through rods and cones. Uh, and the way we knew it was that there are some diseases in which rods and cones degenerate, but those people can keep a 24-hour day perfectly well. So there was some other cell in the retina that we didn't hadn't identified uh, that was giving the signal to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And uh, since then, it has been identified. A very small proportion of the retinal ganglion cells turn out to be this archaic vision uh, system that just detects light and dark and sends that signal back through the uh, optic nerve to the optic chiasm and up to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which inhibits the pineal gland, as I'll show you in a minute. And um, what pigment is exciting those, uh, how are the photons transmitting light into electrical impulses? Well, the, the uh, retinal ganglion cells that are non-image photoreceptors um, are filled with this pigment called melano melanopsin, I'm sorry. And it, it's a little bit like rhodopsin in your uh, rods, but melanopsin responds to blue light at about 480 nanometers. You can make uh, melanopsin and uh, check its uh, spectral response and uh, the center of that is 480 nanometers, which is blue. So uh, what an unexpected thing that organisms would develop a system of detecting light and dark that responded to the same color as the sky. <laughs> so uh, no surprise there. So here is my uh, most obnoxious slide, um, crowded slide, and it's blue. <clears throat> so in this slide, I didn't have space to tell you that DLMO means dim light melatonin onset, which is the uh, catalyzing event for all these reactions. And in the bottom line, uh, DLMO plus six means six hours after dim light melatonin onset. So that is our clock and that's what um, resets it every day and keeps it faithful. This is a very oversimplified view and uh, in the next slide, I, I'm going to show you some other things that reset the clock. Fortunately, blue light is the, the main uh, event that resets the clock, but other things that increase the amplitude of biological rhythms and can reset the clock in absence of blue light are physical activity, socialization, etc. here. When I say melatonin, I don't mean endogenous melatonin, I mean uh, over-the-counter melatonin, and even meals. Meals are potent at resetting peripheral clocks like liver and pancreas. So uh, you're probably wondering at this point, uh, you know, we have not been hunter-gatherers for a while. We haven't even been uh, field workers and agrarians, most of us, for a while. How come we still have a biological clock? <clears throat> and uh, it's true that we get very little light indoors. You may think you're in a well-lit room. You're probably getting 200 lux at most. And outside on a cloudy day, you're probably getting 10,000 lux. And on a clear day, you're probably getting 60,000 lux, maybe on up to 80,000 lux. 
uh, and those are very potent. In addition, in the inside, um, the lights are mostly incandescent, which has very little blue in it. Uh, even fairly recently, um, uh, well, candles certainly had very little blue light, but uh, it took fluorescent lights before we started dosing ourselves at uh, odd times with blue light, and off times really. And now that the um, technology has given us a blue light emitting diode, uh, we can look at our computers and see both blue and white, which we couldn't without a blue LED. Uh, but we can also stimulate our retinas with blue light at any inappropriate or appropriate time of day we want. So here's my slide on uh, how we screw this clock up. I think you're familiar with all the terms except maybe social jet lag. Social jet lag alludes to our tendency to wake up early and go to bed early five nights a week and then uh, set ourselves back uh, an hour or two or three uh, on the weekends. So it's as though from a chronobiologic point of view, it's as though we were in Boston most of the time and then took a trip to Denver or uh, San Francisco uh, once a week. And we all do this to ourselves once a year with spring forward and fall back. <clears throat> I told you that the human biochemical clock is a little longer than 24 hours. So making it shorter, making it 23 hours is really hard compared to making it longer and making it 25 hours. So spring forward is justly hated uh, and fall back a little less so. All right. Um, it matters. Uh, our, when we are internally desynchronized, here are some of the things that happen to us. Now this slide conflates two kinds of research. In the first kind, uh, people were given a one week period of eight days. So they had 20 hour days and they cycled from alignment into complete misalignment and back into alignment during that week. And their hormones could be measured while they were in a state of internal desyncrasy. And uh, the measurements were very similar to uh, what happens in diabetes and some other diseases. And others of these, such as the proclivity to cancer and the rap more rapid progression of cancer, come from different experiments that look uh, at shift workers over a long period of time. <clears throat> And you see the industrial accidents and uh, motor vehicle accidents on the way home from shift work and heart attacks. Well, there is a little peak of motor vehicle accidents, heart attacks and deaths right after spring forward every year, the Monday after spring forward, um, which we're about to undergo in eight days. Uh, and it, that peak vanishes in a few days as people realign their clocks. Here is a, I cribbed this uh, probably copyrighted picture from somebody who wanted to emphasize the uh, hormonal and metabolic problems with desynchronized clocks. Don't pay any attention to the times being displayed. They just make the point of desynchrony. So I recently listened to a lecture by uh, Michael Young, not the hockey star, but the no Nobel Prize winning chronobiologist from 2017. 
he was talking about his discoveries to uh, an audience in Shanghai, said that he had left Rockefeller uh, several days earlier and his central clock was okay. He had readjusted by light exposure, but uh, his liver and pancreas were barely over the Pacific yet. And the point he was making is that um, these clocks uh, don't respond instantly to stimuli and the peripheral clocks don't respond instantly to the, the main clock, the central clock in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that dyssynchrony is bad for you. <laughs> but he was willing to do it to give the lecture. And he said, once I'm about the same time I'm all here, it'll be time to head back to New York. Now, people do not present to the doctor's office and say, I think I have a clock dyssynchrony going on. What do they complain of? They complain of sleep problems. So chronobiology has snuck into medicine as a sleep disorder. <laughs> In psychiatry, we classify all our disorders according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, now version five. So DSM-5 has placed chronobiologic disorders or circadian disorders uh, in the sleep disorder category. There are basically, I'm going to reduce these ridiculously, uh, simplify them, insomnia, sleep apnea, circadian disorders, and sleepwalking. That's uh, sort of a cartoon version of this category. And within the sleep, uh, the circadian disorders, here's what we have. Now, delayed sleep disorder is not just being a night owl. Be, being a night owl or being a morning lark are chronotypes, but to have a real circadian disorder, you have to be three or four or more hours out of phase with your social demands. Um, and these people are miserable, but they're getting up to go to work or school in the middle of the biological night for them. And uh, their clocks are longer than, considerably longer than 24 hours. And they can only stay in phase uh, with effort. Give them a vacation and they are happy as clams. They recover. They are, you know, getting up at uh, noon and going to bed at uh, 8 a.m. and they are doing fine. Now, part of the exciting new stuff in chronobiology is the, the gene angle. Al almost all of it is genetics. And um, the University of Utah people have found a single nucleotide mutation in the period two gene that accounts for advanced sleep phase syndrome in a pedigree of uh, Utah patients. And the Rockefeller group has found a single nucleotide uh, transposition in uh, the cryptochrome one gene that is part of the clock system that accounts for delayed sleep phase in a pedigree of New Yorkers. So uh, probably morning owls and night uh, morning larks and night owls uh, have biological abnormalities with their clocks. Certainly the extreme ones do that make them non 24 hour um, cyclers. Uh, I was astonished recently to be watching TV and see an ad for what the pharmaceutical industry is calling non 24 which is a sleep-wake disorder that uh, mostly blind people have, um, which can be resynchronized with our product, a melatonin receptor agonist. Shift work disorder, we do that to ourselves. Normal clock, abnormal behavior. <clears throat> now, uh, might some of this poses the intriguing question, might things we think of as medical disorders actually be clock disorders and we don't know it? Well, uh, I've spent a lot of time on this looking at psychiatric disorders. It may be part of the problem for many depressions. It may be the whole problem for bipolar disorder, though it's hard to tell yet. 
and um, we may be doing ourselves mental damage with social jet lag, which is prevalent in the population, but not well understood. You know, the consequences aren't well understood. Can we use some of these things to be healthier? Well, you've been reading a little bit about clocks when you have uh, heard a lot about sleep hygiene these days. What is sleep hygiene? Get up at the same time every morning, regardless of what your schedule is. Exercise during the daytime at the same time if possible. <clears throat> Take a while to prepare for sleep. Let your body um, shut down. Don't exercise or sleep soon before sleep. And turn the damn screen off or at least uh, put the night light filter on it so you're not getting blue light from it if you must watch TV or, or uh, be on your laptop. Um, we can treat jet lag and shift work with light melatonin, coffee, and exercise, though the treatments aren't perfect. Um, it's very interesting what's happening in mania right now. Uh, people who come in in a manic episode to the hospital often are there for a couple of weeks while lithium works, while antipsychotics work. But if they will agree to dark therapy, no ray of light for uh, 36 hours, often the manic episode is terminated right then and there. So look for news, watch this space uh, for chronobiologic treatment of mania. And everybody knows about uh, seasonal affective disorder, which is very treatable with bright white light. Now, recently we've discovered that people who take drugs for osteoporosis aren't getting the bang for their buck that they could if they took the drugs at the right time. And uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, uh, I ran across report of a study in the Dutch population, a very large population on the antihypertensive drug lisinopril. And I was additionally captured because I take lisinopril for prehypertension. And uh, the authors ask this interesting question, and this is happening throughout medicine. Does it not only do what we approved it to do, in this case, lower blood pressure, but does it have good life consequences? So are there fewer heart attacks and cardiac deaths in people who take lisinopril? And this very large study of hundreds of thousands of people who do and don't take lisinopril did show a uh, significant signal that it helped. Um, <clears throat> but the interesting thing came in the post hoc analysis where you slice and dice the data in many different ways. And it turned out that the people who take their lisinopril in the morning, i.e. most of them, were not getting benefit. The people who take it at night were accounting for all the benefit of lisinopril. So now I take mine at night. And it makes sense. Uh, of the top 100 drugs prescribed in the United States, uh, about 50% and maybe more show uh, are, are targeted at a, a receptor or enzyme or something that shows a circadian pattern, a pronounced circadian pa pattern. And uh, if my lisinopril, uh, which is a um, um, ACE inhibitor, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme uh, inhibitor, is trying to inhibit uh, angiotensin converting enzyme when it isn't really there, then how can it do me any good? So I think one way chronobiology will make a big splash very soon is by uh, going over all the drugs we are now using and saying, take this one at night, take this one at 3 p.m., et cetera. So uh, let's talk for a moment about what chrono hygiene might look like. Um, I don't have a slide for this, so I guess I'll get rid of my slides. So uh, what does all this mean for our uh, healthiest use of time and interaction with it? Well, uh, sleep hygiene, I, I mentioned most of these points. Um, 
as we age, our biological rhythms damp down, and we really want to try to promote the biggest amplitude or acrophase uh, during the day as we can. And that would start with getting good morning light, uh, getting the sky in your eyes. Even if you're behind a, a window, most of your vision can be taken up by sky for 20 or 30 minutes in the morning, sometime in the morning. Then uh, finding a time for physical exercise strong enough to, uh, for your body to take note of, staying away from light, sleep, and exercise in the hours when your body is preparing for rest. Uh, I think that would be the, um, the best early approach to a chrono-hygiene regimen. So now I really will stop and ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larry. Um, and if people want to ask a question or have a comment, if you could either raise your hand in the using uh, the visual fanning your hand in front of the screen, or there's something known as reactions on the side, and you can click that and raise your hand, um, or just put it, a message in the chat. You want to um, raise your hand? I, I, I was going to just wait. Oh, you're unmuted. So, did you want to start, Bob? Larry, um, I, I, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. I did a little bit of research um, in uh, experimental psychology on this years ago, and um, it's just really fascinating to see how some of this turned out. So I have a practical, a couple of practical questions in mind, but I'll start out with one. <laughs> um, it, interesting about taking medicines at certain times of the day, and that this, I, I gather, may be sort of a new science. And so my question for you is, when we are going in for our physicals or just happen to be talking to our doctors, um, what kinds of questions might we pose about timing of various things? So good luck with that. Your physician is unlikely to uh, be aware of most of this, although I think the lisinopril story did get uh, the attention of a lot of primary care people and general internal medicine. But you could say, is there anything known about the most effective time to take this particular pill and the others. Um, I, I told you about uh, Bill Roshevsky and cancer chemotherapy. They couldn't make that work. Most big groups who tried to increase survival by uh, timing the chemotherapy were unable to do it, but it's starting to come back into vogue right now um, because uh, it, it's beginning to look like uh, biological rhythms suppress cancers. And um, the, what we want out of that is individualized. It's um, the toxicity to the host of, uh, to the host cells of the chemotherapy regimen and the toxicity to the cancer cells of the chemotherapy regimen and the time of day when that difference is biggest, that we can get the biggest anti-tumor dose tolerated by the host. And uh, there is now active work on that going on. And I think the oncologists will be more aware of this than your, your general uh, internist. Thank you. See, Patrick, Hi. Oates, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, um, actually, Melinda, I had a question. Um, Larry, wonderful talk. Thank you so much for um, deepening our understanding of these various aspects of circadian rhythms and the impact in so many ways that I wasn't aware of. Um, I um, had talked, was working with, after uh, I was working with a Chinese acupuncture and a herbalist, and, and he talked about the importance of going out first thing in the morning, and then also recommend these low blue light glasses. And they're not all equal in their ability to block the blue light. Um, but I was curious about 
the usage of blue light glasses to help mitigate the impact of, um, you know, television, other kinds of screens, in addition to stopping using them earlier, which is, of course, on, on me or whoever's not stopping using their screens. But I um, wondered if you had recommendations about low blue light glasses and, and your sense of their efficacy. Um, it keeps changing because uh, companies come out with uh, new products all the time, and uh, then they have to be tested, and are they really blue blocking as they say they are? So uh, I, I would do the same thing you're going to do and look it up on my phone. But I do try to uh, avoid looking at screens at night unless, um, and that in includes your reader, unfortunately, your Kindle or whatever. The white light is made up of uh, blue among other spectral uh, colors. Um, so if, if you have a real blue blocking uh, screen option, it'll look yellow, yellow and dark. Uh, so look for that if you're going to be reading at night. I'll send you the information about the one that I've been using that seems to be really effective and has some, some good research behind it, just in case it's helpful for you to know about. But thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I think the Krings are next. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Yep, got it. Thank you. Um, just want to make sure, uh, Larry, it's a fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, so as we approach bedtime, whether we're old or young, is it helpful? Did you say limit light sleep and exercise or, or was it light eating and exercise? What Light feeding and exercise. Eating. It's gonna okay. be, uh, there are going to be evolving um, recommendations with more and more evidence uh, on when you should eat what. <laughs> and it will, will not be heavy stuff uh, late in the day. Got it. And then for someone who is on shift work, doing a night shift, as they are coming off their night shift, going home, sleep, do you recommend they try and sleep then? Or should they exercise, eat something, and then go to sleep? Or what, you know, what, what, is, what does a night shift worker do? Uh, I do have a good source for this. A uh, uh, Boston psychiatrist, I think he's Beth Israel guy named Charlie Zeisler, C-Z-E-I-S-L-E-R, has devoted his career to recommendations to uh, about shift work. Shift work is necessary. Shift work, like so many other things, is um, foisted on those who can't afford not to do it. And... Uh, so they bear the biological burden often. And uh, it, what, what's important is bright light at the very beginning of the shift and during the shift and other stimuli like caffeine and exercise uh, during the beginning of the shift so that the day starts for those people then. Okay. Then usually uh, they go home and don't immediately get into bed. So the, the, uh, they are replicating what the rest of us do, but uh, 12 hours off. Okay. <clears throat> or however many, uh, you know, or, or whatever time their shift starts compared to our seven o'clock in the morning. Oh. And that does reduce uh, industrial accidents, uh, motor vehicle accidents on the way home, increases efficiency and so forth. Uh, gr uh, great talk, oh, Larry. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one more thing. The important thing for shift workers is not to cycle back to everybody else's time during okay. their weekends. Okay. Uh, because that that immediately introduces uh, dyssynchrony. Okay. Uh, sorry, Roy, go ahead. Yeah, great talk, Larry, and it didn't put me to sleep. Um, <laughs> uh, I worked my nearly my entire career just working night shifts. Uh, and there, I understand there's some evidence that people who do rotating shifts do have an impact on life expectancy and their health. Uh, is that also true of people who just work night shifts? Uh, it's a little hard for me to tell what the way the research gets presented is shift work without any further specifiers. And I think uh, in a way, since most shift workers do switch back to uh, sort of common time on the weekend, it's pretty much the same they, even if you work nights, if you then abandon uh, 
that shift uh, every week, you are swing shifting basically. Mm -hmm. And yes, the the rate of uh, premature death and uh, well, uh, one interesting fact, I'm talking to both the cranes here, interesting to say this, the divorce rate is five times as high <laughs> in shift workers as in the rest of us. Really? So good job hanging wow. in there, guys. Wow, um, wow, <laughs> thanks. It makes you unhealthy and cranky. Uh, <laughs> specifically empathy and um, goes down and impulsiveness goes up in shift workers. Thank you. Yeah, Rick Rosen, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Larry, like everyone else, that was really wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I wondered if you uh, could comment about the value of naps or not. Napping. Oh, napping. Um, yes, the only what I hear, and the chronobiologists tend to uh, say two things about napping. One is that a short nap during the day doesn't do you any harm. It doesn't reset your clock. Uh, a larger nap that has an impact on nighttime sleep might do that, might reset your clock because it's, it's messing with your nighttime sleep. Uh, they also say that uh, sort of the native state of humans, especially in the winter months, is to have two sleep intervals, a uh, first sleep and a second sleep. And this caught on in the popular press and, and got bigger than I think it actually is. Uh, I, I don't encourage anybody to cultivate two sleeps who doesn't now do so. And your tendency to take in blue light uh, while you're up at night um, would be far more damaging than what light anybody had available in the Middle Ages and, and before. So mm -hmm. naps are probably okay as long as uh, they do not interfere with nighttime sleep. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Carol Apple, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, Larry, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, asking my question because I I also take lisinopril and I'm confused now. <laughs> I'm actually great, grateful for what you said about the timing because my CVS bottle says, take it in the morning. Now, should I be talking to CVS about this or uh, now do I just change? Or, Email like, your prescriber and say, this guy I was just watching said, but it's a once a day drug, nobody cares if they haven't seen this, your prescriber th will think at night is just as good as at the morning and, and will let you off the hook there. Um, so uh, most drugs are, the, the pharmaceutical industry is very keen on once a day drugs because uh, if you take drugs two or three times a day, they know you're gonna forget some doses and they won't sell as much of them. And if you take, drugs three or more times a day, it's almost impossible to take all the doses you're supposed to take. So most of the meds we have now are once a day formulations, even if they were twice a day or three time a day drugs. And um, they we need to find out when the best time is for them. So I'd say it's settled for lisinopril. And I think your PCP will let you do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Webb, we have a question from uh, on the chat from Karen. Yeah, I saw that. Um, Larry, may, maybe you saw, I'm gonna check the gallery as well, but the question is how long it might take effect for someone to see improvement after they correct their morning light exercise, slowing down before they go to sleep. Well, that does depend on whether you have any clock problems or not. If you have insomnia or some other clock problem, um, you would certainly notice it sooner. If you don't, and you're simply trying to strengthen your rhythms and uh, maybe decrease your chances of getting cancer, or have better digestion or so forth, it might take a long time to notice or you might never notice that you've benefited yourself. But if you do have a problem um, and you do the 
uh, hygiene regimen, your central clock, your main clock, will respond within a few days, and the other clocks will uh, come along in, in the, the, the week or so following that. Thank you. That's uh, amazing that it happened so fast. Yeah, all this stuff is messy, wet biochemicals, and it is just amazing that we have such precision with it. Dot has a question. Am I unmuted? I think so. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Um, Larry, um, getting back to this, how to reset the clock in terms of um, someone, not myself, but someone I know who has had severe sleep problems for a very, very long time. And I think you kind of hinted that most physicians really are not into this chronobiology. So um, is there a way to, to help a person who's had sleep problems for a very long time? Could that person start a regimen of, of light at the appropriate times and different kinds of lights? Is there a recipe for that that might work for someone who's had this for a long time? Well, uh, it's, it's just tempting for me to say, yeah, good, do what I said about uh, chrono hygiene. But really, sleep problems need to be diagnosed. And uh, if they're miserable, uh, they could ask for a referral to a sleep center. There might be something going on like sleep apnea or something else that uh, chronobiology will not fix. And so getting to the root of the problem would be very important. Uh, if that fails, uh, I think there are very few people who wouldn't either have some benefit or at any rate no harm from taking in uh, morning light in a regular way and doing exercise in a regular way and getting their feeding schedules uh, on, uh, on a fairly regular basis. Um, I have friends and people I know who are in the same boat and uh, they haven't taken my recommendations. It's hard to change your habits. Uh, but if they're miserable, you can uh, try to get them to give it a try for a week. Go ahead, Ellen. I think you're next, and then George. Okay, I just had a question. You know, you hear these stories that teenagers need more sleep, and I wonder if you can speak speak to that. Um, I'm sure it has something to do with chronobiology, but I don't understand it best. Yeah, uh, the field doesn't understand it terribly well either. Babies, of course, are born without any uh, discernible cycles, at least sleep-wake cycles, and there probably hasn't been any research on their biochemistry either. Um, by the time kids are three and four, they're, they are uh, well organized. In fact, they, they start getting their days and nights organized around five months. And uh, by the time they are uh, children, they are behaving pretty much as adults on an adult circadian schedule. But uh, when those adolescent hormones start coming out, uh, suddenly, and this goes for males more than females, the length of their clock, uh, the, the cycle length lengthens and they become uh, night owls. They have a terrible time for a few years uh, being on our schedule. And uh, educators are beginning to realize this and employers are beginning to realize this. And then um, the other thing happens at the other end of life, uh, as we age, we become morning larks, our chronotype, you know, we sort of ease into the, um, what's it called, the early bird special group. And uh, we probably have um, circadian cycles a little shorter than everyone else and uh, tend to get up earlier and uh, go to bed earlier. And that is another good reason for older people to pay us particular attention to getting good sleep hygiene. 
So the, the reasons that, that hormones affect the clock in this way across the life cycle, I, as far as I know, are not understood yet. Thank you, Larry. George, you can unmute yourself. Actually, Carol. I, I just did. Okay. Carol's going to unmute um, so that we don't create feedback. Um, I just wanted to respond to Dot's thing and, and also uh, in general. Um, I suffered from a lot of sleep, sleep problems for many years as well. And uh, one of the things that it produced was a lot of fatigue and, you know, daytime sleepiness. <clears throat> and so I did go uh, through Leahy Clinic's sleep lab um, about four years ago now. And it turned out that, yes, indeed, I had sleep apnea to the extent that I was basically waking up close to 50 times an hour. If you can imagine that, you know, you're, you're waking up every, almost every minute or minute and a half. And certainly you do not get sleep that way. And I was, I was not, you know, you're not aware of it. You, you, it's not something you're, you're, you're that aware of, but it's, it's um, you never get into the deep sleep. So I um, was prescribed a, a, a BiPAP machine. Um, there are CPAPs and BiPAPs and the, just the difference, the CPAP is constant pressure and the BiPAP uh, is different pressure on inhalation and exhalation. And that has made all the difference in the world, absolutely all the difference in the world. And so anybody who's suffering from that kind of problem, um, you know, you, you really are not uh, going to be able to do much to control your, your, your uh, rhythms, your, your circadian rhythms, um, unless you deal with the, the sleep just, uh, problem. Good point. So uh, sleep problems do need a workup. They're not all uh, chronological problems. Um, thank you for that. I no no um, payment was offered for that uh, testimony. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been really uh, fascinating. I think all of us learned a lot. I'm trying to squeeze my brain around um, college chemistry and biochemistry again to understand some of the, the details you presented so eloquently. Um, and I wanted to let people know, give a plug to our next Lyceum as well. Um, we're going to have another talk um, Sunday, April 3rd. This will be in conjunction with Bedford, uh, First Parish in Bedford's Peace and Justice Committee's inaugural presentation of the Dave and Ginny Packer Memorial Human Rights Speaker Series with a Dr. Alice Rothschild. And she'll be speaking um, uh, regarding um, Palestinian and Israeli uh, relations. Um, she's a, a physician, an OBGYN for 40 years, author, filmmaker, um, and uh, she's written extensively. Um, it, it should be a fascinating talk. I'll just write, read this one thing to keep it short. Uh, she'll give a personal exploration of the ancient city of Jerusalem with a special focus on East Jerusalem and the surrounding areas of Greater Jerusalem, which have experienced decades of Judaization and erasure, erasure of the Palestinian presence. What are the costs of these policies, not only to Palestinians, but also to Jewish Israelis who are claiming the city as their own and what can we learn and what can we do? It should be very interesting. Um, sorry to take so much time out of people's day for that plug, but I hope you'll join us. Larry, thank you so much. It was great. And thank you, Webb, for all your assistance. Have a great afternoon, everyone.